Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Klein. I will try to talk this afternoon about the standardized total frac digestibility of phosphorus by pigs, and it is kind of a new concept, so I'll try and go through it, uh, how, we, how we calculate it. I do want to point out, however, if you don't get it all today, this presentation will be on our website in a couple of days, and you can go to our website and you can listen to it one more time if you have, should have that interest. Now, what I'll try to do here is first talk about how we determine digestibility of phosphorus in feed ingredients. And <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, different uh, uh, ways to, to do that, and I'll come up with uh, a solution for it and try to tell you that the best way to do it is to do total tract digestibility of phosphorus, okay? Then I'll talk about the different expressions for phosphorus digestibility, apparent total tract digestibility, true total tract digestibility, and standardized total tract digestibility, and I will show you data indicating that the best way for practical feed formulation is to use standardized total tract digestibility. I'll also talk about basal and, and, and total endogenous losses of, of, uh, of phosphorus, which is one of the reasons we, 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 we calculate standardized total tract digestibility, and I'll show you why we, uh, we, we can calculate the standardized total tract digestibility. I'll talk about, a little bit about the fermentation of feed ingredients, and in particular when we go to all these new feed ingredients, some of them have been fermented. What does that mean for our digestibility? And I will show you that the more we have fermented a feed ingredient of a vegetable origin, the greater is the digestibility of phosphorus in those ingredients. <coughs> and then finally, I will also talk a little bit about how do we formulate diets based on values for the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus. And I'll show you an example from experiments we have conducted. And I'll talk a little bit about the matrix values for phytase and how you need to handle that because that's not the same when we move from just a straight corn soy diet, we can do it in one way, then when we go to alternative ingredients with different uh, substrate inclusion, we have to handle phytase in a different way in our formulations. I'll show a little bit about that also. And finally, I'll try to make a few conclusions and uh, draw a few uh, perspectives. Now, before we talk about digestibility of phosphorus, there's a couple of questions we can ask ourselves. Should we calculate the ileal digestibility or the total tract digestibility? And that de determines whether we put the pig in a metabolism cage or if we cannulate the pig and take out ileal digester. So that's the first question we will have to look at. Next question is, does it matter how much phosphorus we have in the diet when we measure digestibility? In other words, do we need to be below the requirement, at the requirement, or above the requirement when we, when we calculate these? So that's the next question we need to answer. And then finally, what is the effect of calcium on phosphorus digestibility? Okay, does it matter how much phosphorus we have in phosphorus? Excuse me. Does it matter how much calcium we have in the diets when we when we uh, determine phosphorus digestibility? So we'll have to be, be, uh, be sure we understand that also. And then finally, we have to discuss: is it apparent, standardized, or true digestibility that we need to use? Okay. First, apparent ileal digestibility versus apparent total tract digestibility. Here are data from an experiment, one of my former students, Bob Bolke, he uh, conducted and we published that in 2005. We had three feed ingredients here. We had, at that time, low phytate corn. I don't have that anymore, but for this purpose it's fine. And then we had also, uh, we had yellow dent corn and we had soybean meal. And you can see we have the apparent ileal digestibility values here. We have the apparent total tract digestibility values here. You see there's some difference between the three. And no matter which ingredient we talk about, this is not very good. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So no matter which ingredient we look at here, there's no difference between ileal digestibility and total tract digestibility. That means we can use either one of them. However, it is easier to determine total tract digestibility than ileal digestibility, and we don't rely on a marker. Therefore, we use total tract digestibility for phosphorus, di uh, for phosphorus uh, digestibilities. Still is not very good, Tim. Okay. Did another experiment here. We had three diets. Control diet, corn soybean meal diet, no phytase, and we had ye yellow bars, the 500 uh, uh, phytase, the 500 units of phytase here, and the red bars, 1,000 units of phytase. The phytase in this experiment was Optifos. And we determined here to ordinal digestibility, ileal digestibility, total tract digestibility. You'll see there's 
no difference between the, among the three diets here at the duodenal digestibility, meaning that about 10% of the phosphorus disappears prior to where we put our cannula in, which was approximately 10 centimeter after the uh, pancreatic duct in the duodenum, so very little absorption there. However, when we go to the end of the ileum, lots of absorption, and you'll see there's a nice response to phytase, you would expect, but you'll also see no difference between the ileal digestibility and total tract digestibility, regardless of the diet we're talking about here. So again, total tract digestibility works just fine. Next question, apparent standardized or true digestibility. I mean, we put the pigs in the, in, in the metabolism cages here. If we just do uh, apparent total tract digestibility, all we have to do is know the input and subtract the output, and we can calculate that uh, apparent total tract digestibility very easy. We have, if we need to do true total tract digestibility, we need to have the intake of phosphorus, then we need to have the output, and then we need to determine the total and uh, endogenous loss of phosphorus also, subtract that from the output, then we get the true digestibility. Okay? And finally, if we want to have the standardized total tract digestibility, we need to have the intake, subtract, and have to take the output again, and subtract not the total endogenous loss, but the basal endogenous loss. And the basal endogenous loss is the loss of phosphorus that is lost in response to any dry matter in the intestinal tract of that pig. Not, not specific for the diet, just because of dry matter. So there are two types of endogenous losses, basal endogenous loss and specific endogenous loss. And the basal is just in response to the dry matter. The specific endogenous loss is endogenous loss that is lost in response to a specific feed ingredient. And in particular, if you have high fiber ingredients, they will induce a greater loss, and therefore you get a, a greater total loss. So that's the difference between total and uh, basal losses here. Now, if you just look at apparent to total tract digestibility, we have some uh, uh, challenges here with those because here's an experiment conducted by Dr. Fan from the University of Guelph about t 10 years ago. He had four different levels of soybean meal in a diet. 13.3, 27.3, 40.80, and 54.6. And then he determined the apparent total tract digestibility. And you can see what happened here. He had less than 20% digestibility. And if he had 13% soybean meal in the diet, if he added twice as much, then he got up to 35% digestibility, about the same at 40% and above 40% digestibility when he was at 54% uh, inclusion rate. So now we have a problem here because we have one feed ingredient but we have four different digestibility values. So which one should you use when you formulate your diet? It's not very easy to determine, right? So based on that, we conclude that the apparent total tract digestibilities are not very practical to use in practical diet formulations because we don't know which value to use. Okay? So we need to go to either true digestibility or to um, st standardized digestibility to do both of them. To do true digestibility, we need to determine total endogenous loss. And this has been determined in six different experiments here in the US over the last 10 years. And you'll see here the values we have 450, 670, 310. These are in milligram per kilogram dry matter intake. 70, 35, and down to 8, and up to 101 here in this experiment. You see there's tremendous variability. It's not possible based on these values to say what is the total endogenous loss of phosphorus. These are very, very variable, these, uh, these values. So it's not easy to calculate true digestibility, OK? Going to basal endogenous loss, instead I've listed 10 experiments. We have to actually have more than, than this. But you'll see there's much less variability here. And you'll see the average here is right around 200 milligram per kilogram dry matter intake. Not a lot of variability in these data. We have done it many, many times. So we can be pretty confident in this value here. So that means we can calculate standardized digestibility values by uh, correcting for the basal endogenous losses. And if we correct these apparent to total tract digestibility values for basal endogenous losses, then we get our values for standardized total tract digestibility. Okay? So it is possible to do it. Here's an example of what it means. We had three different types of, of uh, whey powder here, regular whey powder, then we had whey permeate, and then we had a low ash whey permeate. So this is the, actually the same product, except they took out the ash from this product here. When they take out the ash, 
phosphorus goes down, so we have from 0.57 down to 0.10 here in, in the, these ingredients, but still the same phosphorus. And permate is almost the same as whey powder, as you can tell here. So we determine digestibility in these three ingredients. See the apparent total tract digestibility. Whey powder was more than 80%, permeate more than 80%, but the low ash permeate was uh, less than 60%, only 55% approximately. Okay? However, when we calculated the standardized total tract digestibility, this is apparent total tract digestibility. When we converted this to standardized total tract digestibility, we got right around 91% for all three ingredients. Okay? Why is that? That is because we had the low level of phosphorus in this diet here with the low ash permeate, right? And therefore, the basal endogenous loss contributes more to our output. Therefore, we calculate a very low apparent digestibility value. But when we calculate the standardized value, we don't make that mistake, be, be, mistake because we have corrected for those basal endogenous losses. So the standardized values are very, very uniform across these three diets. Right? And this is why we should use standardized digestibility values, because we can get very uniform uh, uh, values. I showed you before the Dr. Fan's data on apparent total tract digestibility in soybean meal, the four different levels here, the orange bars here, they were, were inconsistent across these four diets. However, if we convert these values to standardized digestibility values using those 200 milligram per kilogram dry matter intake to, to correct them for, you'll see again the standardized digestibility values are much less variable than the apparent digestibility values, right? So standardized digestibility values can be used in diet formulations because we can predict what the, what the values are. So to conclude on this part, we have seen that values for basal endogenous losses, they are less variable than values for total endogenous losses. We've seen that cal we can calculate values for uh, standardized total tract digestibility values by using those basal endogenous losses, and we have seen that the values we get for the standardized total tract digestibility, they are not dependent on the level of phosphorus we have in the diet, and that's what we need to, to do, because that means that those values can be additive in a mixed diet. And that's what we want, because when we formulate diets, we take digestibility values from each ingredient and we put them into a diet. And if they are not additive in that mixed diet, then we will not be able to predict what is the level of digestible phosphorus in that diet. So that's why we think they are additive in, in, in mixed diets. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about was effect of dietary calcium. Just a, a short, uh, a few slides here on that. We published an experiment earlier this year where we had six different levels of calcium in the diet, all from calcium carbonate. Uh, there was a fixed level of phosphorus in all these diets. We measured the apparent total tract digestibility of calcium, and you'll see there's no significant difference here um, among these diets. There's a little bit of noise here, but there's no significant difference among these diets. No effect of the calcium level in the diet on calcium digestibility. That's pretty good. However, we also looked at phosphorus, and the phosphorus, as I said, was the same level in all diets, all supplied by monosodium phosphate. And you can see here that there's a linear reduction in the digestibility of phosphorus as we increase calcium in the diet. A linear decrease in digestibility of phosphorus as we increase calcium in the diet. That means that the phosphorus digestibility that we measure is, de is dependent on the level of calcium in the diet. So we need to know what is the right level of calcium in the diet. And to know that, we need to know what is the digestibility of calcium in our different feed ingredients. And we don't know that because we have never really looked at that until now. So we are trying to do some work in that area to determine calcium digestibility in different feed ingredients. That means we can, we can uh, formulate based on digestible calcium instead of total calcium. And that would, would, will give us the opportunity to find out what is the best level to be at in terms of calcium when we measure phosphorus digestibility. That's an important source. And one more slide here on calcium. I just want to show <clears throat> that calcium homeostasis is not determined by upregulation or downregulation of uptake from the gut. And we, we showed that in the experiment here, we have two different diets, a, di a, a diet with phosphorus and a diet without any phosphorus at all. Okay? So the, the, the orange bar here with phosphorus, blue bars without phosphorus. Have, 
have you ever, have you noticed how, how nice these blue and orange colors go together? It looks really good, right? <coughs> anyway, the pigs that are fed the phosphorus free diet, they reduced feed intake a little bit, but not much. We had the same calcium in both diets. You see a little bit significant reduction in intake, therefore a significant reduction in calcium intake, but not much difference. Absorption, again about the same difference. That means the percentage, the digestibility or the percentage absorption was not different between these two diets. But if you think about it, the pigs who are on a phosphorus-free diet, they had no phosphorus to synthesize bone, okay? So what are they supposed to do with that calcium? They can't utilize it. So what did they do? They excreted it in the urine. You can see the pigs with phosphorus, very low excretion of calcium. The pigs without phosphorus, high excretion of calcium. So the regulation of that calcium is mainly at the renal level, at the excretion level, not at the absorption level, okay? So that, that much we know. That's all I have on calcium at this point. I do have a master's student who is working on calcium digestibility, so we hope over the next few years we will get a lot more data on calcium and learn more about how that's uh, digested and absorbed. Fermented feed ingredients, just a few slides on that. Four different ingredients here, corn and red bars, DDGS, yellow bars, high protein DDG, blue bars, and corn germ in or the orange bar here. This is a, a paper we, I'm a little optimistic, I'm writing Almeida and Stein 2012. The paper is actually not quite accepted yet, but we, we, it, we hope it will be accepted and be come out next year. But <clears throat> what we have here, you can see corn and corn germ, non-fermented feed ingredients, DDGS, high protein DDG, fermented feed ingredients, it's corn phosphorus we are talking about for all four ingredients. And clearly, a big, big difference here in digestibility. Clearly, much more digestible, uh, more, much greater digestibility if that feed ingredient has been fermented, if not fermented. So that helps on the digestibility. If we look at these same four ingredients with added phytase, 500 units here, you can see that the differences are, are much smaller now because the corn and the corn germ respond much more to phytase than DDGS and HPDDG because there's much more su substrate for that phytase. So there's much less difference once we add phytase to these diets. Okay. I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Look at soybean meal. Another one of my current students, he's looked at fermented soybean meal. Again, we have uh, regular soybean meal, fermented soybean meal, orange bars, no phytase blue bars with phytase, and you can see for soybe regular soybean meal, a nice response to phytase. However, fermented soybean meal, much greater digestibility without the phytase. Once we add the phytase, we don't improve that digestibility very much. So both of them end up right around 71% digestibility when we add phytase to the diet. So one more time, if we ferment the ingredient, we have much greater digestibility than if we don't ferment them. And I think that will be important as we look at other feed ingredients. We have recently gotten some data for corn gluten feed, and surprisingly, corn gluten feed are actually much closer in digestibility to uh, DDGS than they are to corn. Probably because ADM, they put a lot of different things into uh, their corn gluten feed, and a lot of those things apparently are fermented products or something that they have, they have s somehow treated in different ways. And I think it's, it may not only be fermentation, it could be many other different types of treatment, and, and wet, wet milling in itself probably also increases digestibility. So, something to think about if we use other diets. Now, the last thing I have here is a little bit about diet formulations based on values for st standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus, and I have a few slides on that from a paper we, we published last year in Journal of Animal Science. And what we did here was we determined digestibility of three different feed ingredients, corn, soybean meal, DDGS, and we have it without phytase, orange bars with phytase, the blue bars here. And what you'll see here is Corn responds very nicely to phytase. Soybean meal responds very nicely to phytase. DDGS, no response to phytase. DDGS, much greater digestibility to start with, as we would expect, because it's fermented, but there's no significant improvement when we add phytase to that ingredient. Okay? Now we had these three uh, ingredients. We, all, we previously dis determined digestibility of uh, phosphorus in, in dicalcium phosphate, so we formulated four different diets. 
and we formulate them to contain the same amount of di standardized digestible phosphorus. So in the first diet was just a corn soybean meal diet, only corn, soybean meal, and we added 1.15% dical to this diet. Next diet, we added phytase to the diet. We used the digestibility values I just showed you. So we reduced the dical here because we had phytase in the diet to get to the same standardized digestible phosphorus. Third diet, we had corn, soybean meal, 20% DDDS. And in this diet, we only needed 0.65% dical because we had the, the DDDS here with greater digestibility. But when we added phytase to this diet, so we had the same corn, soybean meal, and, and DDDS, but now we have 500 units of phytase. We needed no dical in this diet. We could get that uh, diet formulated without any additional phosphorus. Okay? So the total phosphorus obviously varies among these diets, but standardized total tract digestible phosphorus calculated based on our values for the digestibility in these ingredients was constant among these, uh, these four diets. If our theory was correct, then pigs fed these four different diets should perform exactly the same because they get the same amount of phosphorus. So we fed these diets to four groups of pigs, and we started at 11 kilogram, ended up about 21 to 22 kilograms, and you'll see they did all very well. There was a tendency for an improvement in gain and feed intake and final body weight when we added those 20% DDGS to the diets, but not significant, and there was, uh, otherwise they all did very well here on these diets. We then took some pigs, fed these diets, and put them into our metabolism cages, determined phosphorus retention and phosphorus excretion, and you'll see a retention here. It actually went up a little bit for the uh, digestibility, for the DDDS diets here, but there was no difference between no phytase and phytase. You see there's no phytase effect. There is a small DDDS effect. That indicates we may have actually underestimated the digestibility of phosphorus in those DDDS, uh, in DDDS a little bit, but no, diff no effect of phytase as you would expect because we had tried to have the same amount of standardized digestible phosphorus in the diet. But look at excretion. We cut it from 168 grams per day to 0.82, 143 to 0.82 went here. So it's about a 50% reduction in phosphorus excretion as we formulated these diets based on standardized total tract digestibility and with phytase in the diet. And remember, these pigs were fed no dical, but just, had just corn, soybean meal, and did it just plus phytase. So no dical even from 11 to 21 kilograms. Did very well. Okay. So with that, you can start and say we need to know how much phytase can we put into the diets because we may not always need to have 500 units in there to get our maximum responses. So we conducted another experiment where we had four different level of levels of phytase uh, in the diets. This is for corn here. And you can see we got a nice response to phytase, but not much difference after the initial 500 um, uh, units or 420 units here. And then we, based on that, we calculated an equation saying we start out with 42.3% digestibility, and then we get 0.059% uh, percent digestibility for every one FTU of phytase we add to that diet. And there's a quadratic response also here, so we subtract a little bit for that. R square is not great, 0.63, but uh, the, and the model is, um, is uh, significant, however. So what this means is for every 100 FTUs, we, we would get 5.9% increase in digestibility in, these, uh, in, in corn. We did the same thing for corn germ here. Nice response again to corn germ, in particular to the initial 500 units or 390 units in this case. The equation 35.5 plus 0 0.067, so 6.7 6 units for each 100 units of, of uh, phytase we add to, the, to, to this di these diets. Okay. Then we come to DDGS. Now we have a different story. First of all, we start much higher, and there's no significant differences here. The model is not significant for DDGS. So we don't get a response to phytase when we add phytase to DDGS exactly the same as we saw in the previous experiment. Okay? We don't get a response because it's very digestible to begin with, fermented feed ingredient. Okay? And for HP DDGs, uh, we did get a, a significant model, but the, the response was not very high. Now, if you look at these four equations, and I just put them up here together, all four of them, basically, this tells you how much you get 
for a each unit of extra, f uh, extra um, phytase you add to the diet, and you'll see that's different among these ingredients. What does that mean for practical feed formulation? It means that you don't get the same response to phytase in all diets. It depends on the feed ingredients you have in the diet, right? And you don't get a linear response because, as we saw, we got a much greater response for the initial 500 uh, units than uh, subsequent units. So, I'm done. So, when we formulate diets, it's not a good idea to put a, phyta a phosphorus value on, f on the phytase premix. Okay? It's not a good idea to put a phosphorus value on the phytase premix. The way to formulate the, these di what will happen if you do that is, one, you assume the same response regardless of the ingredients in the diet. That's what you assume if you put a, the phosphorus value on your phytase premix. Secondly, you assume a linear response to phytase. Now, you can, you can uh, limit the damage from that by, by putting a maximum on the phytase in, 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 in the formulation. But if you don't do that, you assume a linear response, and you don't get a linear response after 500 units. So the way to formulate diets is actually to put the phytase response on each ingredient. Okay, so you have a digestibility value for corn without phytase. You have another digestibility value with 250 phytase, 500 phytase, 750 phytase, or whatever you you think you you, you you may need. That is the most accurate way to formulate your diets. Okay, so a few conclusions, Brian. Before I end, standardized total tract digestibility values are independent of diet phosphorus concentration. I hope I've, I've demonstrated that to you. We got a, the same value across diets when we have different. Uh, phosphorus in the diets. Standardized digestibility values are additive in mixed diets, which is important for practical diet formulations. Standardized uh, total tract digestibility values support pig performance as expected, as I showed in this experiment we conducted, and therefore it contributes to a reduction in the phosphorus excretion from the pigs, so you will get less phosphorus in the manure. Standardized total tract digestibility values require measurement of basal endogenous losses. However, as we saw, it's relatively constant, so you can use a value of 200 milligram per kilogram dry matter intake if you want to use that when you convert your digestibility values to standardized. And we believe that standardized total tract digestibility values, they better capture the value of phytase than if you use apparent total tract digestibility values because there's no influence of, phos of the low phosphorus levels in some diets. Standardized total tract digestibility values should be used in practical diet formulation. That's what we suggest. And also, if you do modeling in phosphorus, um, of phosphorus metabolism, we believe you get the most accurate results if you use standardized values. Standardized values are influenced by phytase. We saw that they go up for most ingredients when we add phytase. However, matrix values for phytase should be added to each ingredient because we get a different response to the different ingredients we include in the diets. And uh, that may require that you have three, four, five different digestibility values for each feed ingredient in your formulation. And then when you formulate, you, you, you pick the one that matches the level of phytase you have in the diet. So that's how we uh, suggest your uh, diets should be formulated. I want to acknowledge people who have helped me with this every time I say we. That means one of these young people did the work. And uh, they say, Dr. Crumble said this morning, good students make professors look smart. And these are the students who, uh, who have done all the work here. So I want to acknowledge that some of them are in the audience here today. And I also want to uh, repeat that if you need more information on this, go to our website. We have this on our website. And we have a, a newsletter on our website. It's free, so you can sign up for it there. So if you want to know more, go to our website here, nutrition.ansi.illinois.edu. That, Dr. Klein.